Hey, Jinx. Come here, Jinx. Jinx. Hey, Jinx, get out of the tree. You're too high, Jinx. You're too high, Jinx. Hi, Jinx. Strange new worlds. Episode review. Welcome, one and all, to the midway point of Star Trek Strange New Worlds Season 1, Episode 5. This one's entitled Spock Amok, and anyone who's seen the original series of Star Trek knows that this is clearly going to be a reference to Amok Time, that classic episode where Spock and T'Pring's relationship came to its conclusion. So, are we building up to that in that this episode? Obviously we are. Now the brief rundown of this episode states that it a comedy of manners. A comedy of manners. So five episodes into Strange New Worlds, and we're finally running into that classic Trek trope of attempting to do comedy. And one point I will give this episode is they seem to nail that almost cringy, slightly off doesn't quite land form of comedy that we've seen time and time again in Star Trek. If you're a fan of that comedy, you're probably going to get more out of this episode than somebody that is ultimately against Star Trek doing comedy. There were actually a couple moments that made me laugh. There were a bunch more moments that were incredibly cringy, made me feel uncomfortable. If that is the type of comedy you enjoy, you're probably going to get more out of this episode. I don't think much of this episode has long-lasting stakes has long-lasting impacts. There are a couple serious storylines going on, but again, after the last couple of episodes, none of this is is feeling that important as far as galactic import, even though there is a negotiation going on. So we start off here on Vulcan. I would like to make one point. Um, the CG is, you know, fantastic for a fantasy video game type thing. I think that they're going a little too far overboard with these alien landscapes in the CG, and there's got to be a middle ground between the old matte paintings, the cardboard sets composed of, you know, not much, and the computer-generated effects we have now. Maybe they're playing this up a little too much because, as we find out shortly, this isn't real, but I'm just putting that out there because... None of this makes me look like I could actually set foot on this as a real planet that exists in the universe. Just a side tangent. So we find out that Spock isn't the Vulcan version of Spock. He is a human, and T'Pring is not going to marry a human. She calls for the ritual battle, as we saw in a muck time, and she's you know pointing at somebody that Spock is going to have to face. He's like, what, what? Who am I going to fight? Well, it turns out to be a pure Vulcan version of himself. Obviously, 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 this is just a human side and Vulcan side of Spock battling each other in a completely literal fashion. I don't think they were trying to be coy or subtle about it at all. They fight and they fight and they fight and they fight. The classic da 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 plays. Great to hear that. And then, surprising absolutely no one, Spock wakes up. This was all a dream. They even mention it later in the episode that Spock, well, Vulcans themselves are completely logical creatures. Their history, their um, imaginations, their dreams are very, very literal. There's no real subtext, no subtlety, nothing to translate. So at least they hung a lantern on it and it wasn't played as supposed to be a very serious dream. Obviously, Spock's dealing with his human versus Vulcan side, a complete trope of him. So, you know, not going to fault that too much. Then we get to the crux of the why, what's going on. Um, they're docked at Starbase 1, I think it's called. The uh, the one we saw earlier, which is retrofitted after the Klingon battle. The one with all the trees and stuff. Everyone's going on shore leave. So they're back at Earth. They're docked at Space Dock 1, Space Station 1. Can't remember exactly what it's called. They're all going on a break. They're all, you know, relaxing after the horrible Gorn encounter while the ship gets fixed up. And uh, we're basically going to break off into several different groups. As I mentioned, Spock and T'Pring, they're going to be one of the groups here. Uh, T'Pring has come to visit him. She's also got a little business while she's here. And Spock just has to take care of some delegation business with Pike. So that's going to be one of the main groups. Spock and T'Pring trying to deal with their relationship that was cut a bit short because of his early return to Starfleet in the first episode of this season. The other 
main storyline going on is Spock, Pike, and Uhura's there, although I'm not even positive she gets a line. Um, so she's basically relegated to background dressing because she's there, and she probably is there to do some of her linguistic stuff and get some of these uh, rotation points or whatever for doing a Federation briefing, a Federation negotiation, whatever you call it. And this is the alien race here who is petitioning to join the Federation. Well, no, the Federation wants them to join the Federation because they are tactically located between the Klingons, the Romulans, and the Federation. There's this whole triangular zone, which if this group were to join the Federation, we could have better travel into the Beta Quadrant. So we're trying to get them to join. They've already done negotiations with the Tellarites. That didn't end well. They're possibly already negotiating with the other two factions. So we're here to close the deal before them. That's the Pike part of the story, and Spock also needs to help with that. Then we've got the Nurse Chapel, Ortegas, Benga. They're all going to celebrate, or not really celebrate. They're all going to enjoy life um, down on their shore leave. And he's Benga's going to go fishing. Chapel and Ortegas are going to go mingle and try to hook up with People, I suppose there's this whole storyline of Chapel going on where basically she doesn't want commitments. She just wants to have fun, man. Just wants to, you know, keep it cash, keep it casual. And the other group is Laan and Una who are staying on the ship to do their job because as it was pointed out by Umbenga on accident, Una is known as the person where fun goes to die. And Laan is kind of following in the same pattern the same mold obviously she was sort of basing herself on una so they're going to be on the ship trying to cut loose and uh figure out how to be more human how to be more casual i guess you could say that's going to be their running storyline now i do point this out here spock and um to bring their their whole thing going on is they don't like hijinks so what's going to happen What's going to happen to the two people that are least interested in hijinks? There's going to be some hijinks. What we find out is things are going to switch up basically at the halfway point. So Una and Laan, they find a couple of uh, ensigns or cadets or some low-ranking officers trying to complete Enterprise Bingo. They didn't know what that was. After an interrogation scene where they go back and forth and do the good cop, bad cop situation, they find out about the Enterprise Bingo. They'd never heard of it before, so after doing some research, they find out what it is. And uh, here are some of them. I don't believe we actually saw these before. So, the first one that they try, and there's a little montage on the, of them trying a couple things, is transporter to re replace gum. To reflavor gum, I, could, I should say. And they try that out. Uh, Laan is chewing gum transporter out back in and the gum miraculously has its flavor again and they've also got a, a phaser stun thing where they have a little fake phaser fight on the lowest setting not really sure what that has to do with the bingo but okay uh then they do a thing where they both get in the turbo lift grab the handle and say a different deck or a different location at the same time to see who wins they do that um some we don't see are set the universal translator to Andorian. This would have been a perfect place to bring in Hammer, who is not in the episode whatsoever. We don't see that one. Then there's a gravity boot hang challenge. Reminds me of uh, Star Trek V, where Spock was using the gravity boots. Uh, medical tri tricorder challenge. Vulcan, I think it's supposed to be a Vulcan marsupial, but it says Vulcan marupial. So did they misspell that or am I am I completely missing the point there? Anyways, um, then there's a food replicator challenge to eat durian fruit. That's a real life thing here on Earth. It's a terribly stinky fruit. Uh, Singapore, um, fun fact there, it's actually banned there because it's so smelly. So wouldn't recommend eating it unless that's your thing. It's a delicacy to some. So, hey, I'm not here to judge. If you want that sort of stuff, go for it. Then there's a sneak a triple into the... Couldn't catch what that one is. Sit in the captain's chair. And then there's another one that says something about uh, an EV suit. But, uh, you know, all I could really see is EV suit and it was cut off. So those are some of the Enterprise bingo challenges. If you'd like to try them on your own, some of them are actually doable. So 
let me know if you're going to check those out because I would be interested to see how they go. <laughs> so that's kind of the setup for La'an and Una for the rest of the episode. Just kind of trying to break loose, cut free, and have a good time. Um, this is pretty much the only shot of Mbenga's trip. This is a gorgeous shot of him fly fishing. He doesn't even say a word. He just has a sweet turn to the camera and then casts his line. It's the only shot we get of him on shore leave because the next time we see him, he's back on the ship. So good for you, Mbenga. You were there enjoying yourself. I don't know why we couldn't spend more time with you, but you're in the episode. So A plus Mbenga. Um, Kapring is also on the ship because she's got to track down this Vulcan extremist who doesn't believe in logic. Something along those lines wasn't a, wasn't clear on that. But here is the crux of the hijinks and shenanigans that happened with Spock and Tapring. You ready for this one, folks? I don't think you're ready for this one. They tried to do a soul look into each other's soul through some sort of Vulcan meditation mind meld hijinks thing, and it backfired. Uh-oh, they accidentally switched bodies. That's right, that sci-fi trope of uh, accidentally switching bodies happened. I find it interesting that it happened between Spock and Tapring, a character who we very, very minimally know, instead of Spock and a, another character we know. Usually it's fun to see these situations happen between two well-established characters we've grown to know, so that when we see them trying to act as that other character, we see, oh, <laughs> you know, Jonathan Frakes is doing a Patrick Stewart impression or something along those lines. It was interesting to see it among two characters we don't really know. And this is the third character, actually the fourth character Ethan Peck was trying to play in this episode. He had to play fully human Spock. He had to play fully Vulcan Spock, his normal half-human, half-Vulcan Spock. And he had to play himself inhabited by T'Pring. So this actually gave Ethan Peck quite a bit to do. You could tell he was actually doing a different acting job when he was fully human and fully Vulcan, even in that very briefest moment. And he was acting a bit different. So he does have some range. I will give it to him there. He does have some range. Um, so anyways, this is Spock into Pring's body when he is trying to, she is trying to track down this Vulcan extremist guy. Um, has a little chat. Doesn't go well. So Spock into Pring's body just decks the guy in the face. That's how he takes him down. Just boom, punches him right in the face. Problem solved. Mission accomplished. Chapel came with him because we need to now establish apparently the Chapel pining for Spock um, story arc. I don't know where they're going to go with it. The only thing I'm worried about is we saw Chapel still pining after Spock in the original series. So I hope it's not going to be a lot of her lusting after Spock for five years of the show. I hope it's just kind of a quiet background thing. So Chapel and Mbenga are recalled to the ship where they need to figure out a medical way to swap them back. Some shenanigan sort of thing where he puts some mashed up jellyfish or something on their heads and that's going to allow the transfer. Whatever. It, it's not really played for seriousness, so I'm not going to you know, sit here and techno babble my way out of it. The main storyline was going on. Well, I say main storyline. I think the Spock and Tapring storyline was a main storyline, but the this seems more relevant to Starfleet, to the Federation, to ongoing negotiations and whatnot, where they're trying to get these people to join the Federation. Um, after a meeting with Spock and Pike, they basically say, well, we need to have a meeting with just Spock. Obviously, as I just told you, Tapring is in Spock's body, so Tapring as Spock has a conversation with him. Doesn't go as planned. Pike intercedes, even though he wasn't allowed to talk by the aliens. Um, basically, to twofold, show to Tapring that Spock is amazing, tell to Tapring that Spock is amazing, and the unintended side effect of that was to show the aliens that uh, Pike isn't this overbearing, horrible person. Pike is, you know, representing the Federation, the, the Starfleet in a different way. They're intrigued by that. At the end of the episode, Pike throws a little gambit, basically telling them, you've got no reason to join Starfleet. You've got no reason to join the Federation. You've got, you know, nothing but your own interests at heart. I can respect that. We're only talking to you because of the political gain. 
and I'm just being straight with you. They liked that. That was a big you know plus for them. So they're like, you know what, Pike, you convinced us. I like this. I like the fact that this is probably the first time that Pike is acting in a way that the that a Starfleet captain we would like to know is acting. He's using his own abilities. He's doing something by himself. He's not, you know, going around and getting help from the entire crew. He is doing a captain's job here. Probably the first time we've really had to see that this episode, this season. So a plus to to Pike there. Um, we get this cool shot of uh, their solar ship reminiscent of the one we saw in DS nine and the enterprise again, too overly CG for me, but it's not, you know, the end of the world. Then we've got this scene of Laan and Una doing the final challenge, which is to sign the scorch as they call it, which turns out to be the last, not the last, but the oldest original part of the enterprise. So it's the oldest plate on the ship that has not been replaced, not been damaged, not been blown off, whatever. And that's the last Starfleet enterprise bingo, whatever you want to call it. They're doing this. Now, I thought this was going to be something different. I thought they were going to use these life support belts that we saw in the animated series. I thought that would have been cool if they referenced them. But no, they uh, end up showing us they were just put a force field over the hull, and that's why they were able to walk on it. Something I did notice while they were walking on the hull, their com, not com badges, I guess they're just Starfleet insignia at this point. They kept reflecting green. And obviously they were reflecting the green from the green screen kind of took me out of the, a little bit. I know I'm being super nitpicky um, and I don't, I don't want to say that's a huge problem because it's not, but it's just something I noticed and it did take me out of it a little bit, probably because I was already feeling a little iffy on the CG this episode anyways. Then here we are here where they, uh, Una signs it, her full name, uh, Una Chin Riley actually puts the number one. That was a nice touch. Laan had signed it too. You can see some other signatures here. Let me know if any of these stick out to you as somebody important, famous to the Star Trek universe. I didn't look any of them up. None of them specifically stood out to me as being somebody that I knew, but I'm sure someone will let me know that they are. Um, so Hemmer wasn't in this episode. Again, no George Kirk in this episode. I, I don't know if he's just going to fade into the distance for a while, but I was kind of hoping he'd be the running red shirt who always gets knocked out every episode until he his eventual fate in TOS. Obviously, that's not going to happen, but, you know, again, not too many high stakes in this episode. It was nice to hear the callbacks to the music a couple times, the fight music, the uh, classic theme song was played when the aliens decided to join the federation it was nice to see pike in his green in the green tunic sort of uniform that uh don't believe we'd seen yet in the show mentioned this in one of my thumbnails not the video why why do they call them uniforms i mean we've seen about 632,000 different variations of uniforms since especially since new trek started you know everyone's always wearing a slight variation or a different you no know, why, why call them uniforms? There's nothing uniform about them. They're all different. Not nitpicking that because most of them look gorgeous. Most of them are beautiful, but it's not really uniform if everyone's always wearing something different. Um, Not a very substantial episode. Nothing that's really going to have long lasting impacts. It was fine. I didn't dislike it. I didn't love it. It was, you know, it was fine. If you're, you know, a lighthearted kind of throwaway episode that does deal with the future of a couple of things. It's fine. It was a nice respite from the, you know, bit of action that we saw last episode. I don't know why I was just going to hum there. <laughs> but anyways, those are my thoughts. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave your thoughts in the comments below. I don't think there is anything wrong with this episode. It's going to be, you know, basically all on you if you like this uh, pseudo Star Trek humor that we get sometimes. So if that's your thing, if that's something you enjoy, then I think you're really going to like this episode. If not, it's probably going to be a, a struggle for you. But until next time, computer and program.